get up, get, get up, get up. All right, what's up guys? We're here with another bonus episode at MLB Network. Today we're talking with Matt Fascursion. Great, great announcer. I mean, we're super excited yeah. to be here. Yeah. Just okay? Yeah. You with that type of... I think it's right. safe to say you're pretty good. I have my moments. Can we say great voice? Yeah, okay, I'll take okay. that. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> well, I was looking through your Wikipedia and I, don't, I didn't know this. I, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you were a child actor. Yeah. And you yeah. were in the candidate with Robert Redford, yeah. who's like one of the greatest actors of all time. Yeah. What was that like? Well, he pretty much got all his skills from me on that <laughs> shot. Um, now I, I don't have that clear a memory of it. I was handed into a scene, I delivered my line, and I was handed out of the scene, and I got a laugh, and the only reason I got the gig is because I had a squeaky voice. <laughs> and they were looking for basically a kid to clown on, and at the time, you don't know, and I was pretty much a trained you know, stooge at those yeah. things, and they'd wind you up and say, say this, and you do it, and then you go and you get a ham sandwich and you go home. It was fine. That's unbelievable that you had a squeaky voice and I got you a role. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Any other crazy child acting experiences, memories, people you worked with that you uh, can, take, can take to what you do now? No, I, you know, I was in an episode of Streets of San Francisco when I was a kid, which, by the way, all that stuff's on YouTube now, and I just, my son, who's eight, found it, <laughs> which oh. was pretty amazing, and I <laughs> was cool. eight when I was in that wow. show, so there was something cool for me there. Um, I don't know, I was in a scene once with John Ritter on a sitcom, oh, wow. which was really cool, and he was the nicest guy you could have ever imagined, but, you know, I was never destined to become an actual actor, because when you get to the age where you're aware of what you're doing, that's when your chops go away. <laughs> also known as the Jerry Mathers syndrome, leave it to beaver. Like uh, he, was, he was an actor, but you know, when he was a little leave it to beaver guy, there was some charm about it. And then you get into those awkward teen years and you're not as, you're too aware. Yeah. So yeah. I was never gonna go far. <laughs> you also have had quite the career broadcasting, baseball, football, a bunch of different events, but I wanna talk about the XFL because okay. even though I was really young, I like, remember the XFL being like this huge deal and you were one of the original broadcasters of yeah. the XFL. What was that like to be a part of that? Well, at first it was pretty exciting because uh, it was new. There was a ton of muscle behind it and NBC was really committed to making it work. But it was so ill-defined that um, both of the larger than life broadcast giants who were in charge of this thing, Vince McMahon and Dick Ebersol, were waiting for the other one to come down off the mountaintop and say, this is what we'll do and have it work. And nobody really knew how to make it work. As it turned out, uh, they should have played a year in anonymity, so the quality of football <laughs> was a little bit better. Vince was supposed to be on the sidelines and he couldn't resist and couldn't <laughs> stand himself and he was out there front and center on opening day. They had a massive audience on that first Saturday. The game sucked. We sucked, the tech didn't work. I mean, I could go on and on about my memories from the XFL and it just didn't go the way it should. And I was so mortified at first over my involvement in this thing. I was convinced that, you know, I was being laughed at when I go to Starbucks. Wow. I mean, that's how in my head I got uh, upon that thing failing. Wow. But it was, it was a good learning experience, it really was. You, you don't know anything in this business until you fail miserably, crash and burn style. And it does make you a little bit better, makes you more grateful. And for those that haven't failed, it's coming for you, <laughs> get ready. Are there any other crazy broadcasting jobs in your past that you want to point to as like, this is the wildest thing I did, this was the most risky thing I did, anything just crazy that's happened on your road? Oh boy, I mean, there were times when I would have, you know, done a lot of things for that paycheck. Uh, I did a Harlem Globetrotters game with Arsenio Ooh. Hall. That's wow. actually pretty cool. Uh, Arsenio had a hard time distinguishing when uh, we went to commercial, oh. like when the ball wasn't in play uh. and there was nobody on the court and they said we're going to break in three, two, one. Arsenio was still going. <laughs> Bless his heart. Uh, he was super funny and I regret not having him do my outgoing voicemail um, <laughs> as uh, the prince from um, uh, Prince of Zamunda from, uh, I can, now I can't remember the name of the movie with uh, Eddie Murphy. Oh, Coming to America, Come thank America, you, yeah. thank you. Uh, I did Take a rock, movie. paper, scissors contest with Tom Arnold. <laughs> wow. Rock, paper, scissors, <laughs> world championship. That's right, play Wait by that play. There. Still waiting for the Peabody Award to come around <laughs> for that. Uh, it was on Fox Sportsnet, as much of this garbage was back in the um, early 2000s and 90s. And I did three years of working with Lawrence Taylor on the Tough Man World Championship Boxing Circuit, wow, which actually you? was a blast. Oh my God. That sounds like yeah, fun, yeah. A lot of fun. And LT was 
one of the funniest human beings that I've ever been around. That's Amazing good. personality, super funny. I mean, the most feared defensive player in the history of the NFL yeah. had the most down-to-earth, awesome personality. I loved being around him. He was well, great. What was that first interaction with LT like? Were you scared? Like, I mean, I can, tell you the first, I can tell you the first fight that we ever called. Okay? Yeah, that works. Uh, I don't know what kind of language we can use on this podcast. Uh, but, whatever language you please. All right, so here's the story. So uh, he had never done anything on TV before, and we're calling a fight. And his, you know, his color analysis, his kind of interjections are a little sporadic and he doesn't have the energy that the director and producer are looking for. So they get in our ears and they say, hey, LT. And the fight, by the way, was a normal-ish looking guy against a guy that went 320 named the Highlander who wore a skirt. Oh my God. Right? So the little guy would get on one side of him, punch him there, and then run around him, punch him on the other side of the face, and the Highlander was going like this. And by the time he put up his dukes, so the director opens up LT's ears and says, hey, LT, you know, you should talk about this Highlander, man. He's like, he's big, like maybe go on a diet, lose some weight to be a better fighter. And LT goes, look at this Highlander right here. He's a big guy, man. He's too big. And then he didn't say anything else. And then the director got in his ear and said, <laughs> what about like going on the Atkins diet or something? And LT goes, yeah, you know, that Atkins diet, you know, you don't eat no bread. You eat 12 whole <laughs> chicken <laughs> you ain't gonna lose no weight and he says it <laughs> oh it's amazing God. it was amazing and you know then everybody's laughing in the control room and i'm trying to be like oh and uh we're into the final waning moments of the f and i'm you know dying with laughs. <laughs> he, he was awesome awesome oh good my dude God. yeah that's crazy i also saw that you won an episode of supermarket shuffle when you were supermarket younger. sweep supermarket sweep yeah, yeah. yeah i think it's a new food network name, yeah but. yeah yeah um Boy, an image from that has uh, surfaced too, thanks to our friends at VEASAN, uh, Mitch and Polly, who do follow the money in the morning. And man, I was cultivating this Eddie Munster look, which was just <laughs> devoid of any grooming skills. <laughs> Eyebrows were connecting, like full Armenian you know, thing going. Um, we didn't win the big money, but we did get the shop for the mm -hmm. end of the show, big mm -hmm. prize, and we came one clue short of winning wow. like wow. 1,500 bucks. Would have been pretty cool. Is that, I know they brought some of these back on either Netflix or Hulu. Is yours, is yours on there? Let's hope not, man. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta kill that. <laughs> All right, now moving into your current broadcasting, both with the Padres, now with the Angels. Oh, the other stuff's so much more fun. Yeah, I know, well, oh, it really is. That's <laughs> crazy. I, th I think we could, that might be another episode to talk about all those. But you have the famous call, Santa Maria. Where did that come from? I wish there was a good story there. It's an old family friend. Uh, and the mother, the matriarch of the family, is this wonderful Italian woman who would just proclaim Santa Maria f for everything from like um, a total eclipse of the sun to like, you know, dropping her keys in the sofa cushions. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Santa Maria. And I, I did it in the minors. Um, doesn't really play in, you know, small towns like High Desert, yeah, California, and El Paso, imagine. Texas. Yeah. But, uh, Try not to overdo it. Yeah, but, not a lot of you know. Italian heritage out there. No, no, that was, it went beyond appreciation there. But yeah, it's, it's not much of a story, but it, it just kind of works. And I try to save it from when it's, you know, meaningful, I guess. You've been with the Angels now for a little while. You have two of the best players of this entire generation, Mike Trout and Shohei Otani yeah. in the same team. What's it been like just to call their games and even connect with those guys as much as you have? It's, it's been fun. I mean, um, Mike is as down to earth as any super duper star athlete will ever be for the rest of mankind. He's just a dude. He's Mike from Melville, New Jersey. He really is. He likes the Eagles. He likes spending time with his family. He likes to fish. Um, he likes to play fantasy football just yep, like us. Know. He's right, right. Uh, Tommy Pham's most hated commissioner ever. Uh, but he's a good dude. Shohei's a little harder to get close to because obviously there's a language barrier. Uh, although he speaks, I think, a little bit better than some people might understand. Uh, but he's, you know, he is on his own program, and he's got his own way to train. He's got his own way to warm up. Um, neither one of those guys take a lot of BP on the field, yeah. so your access is limited. Um, but it's fun to call games that are involved in because you, you really know that any day, regardless of the matchup, regardless of the bigger implications of the game, you could see something really great. It's kind of the hot new meme going around where it's like Mike Trout went three for six with two home runs. Cheryl Otani pitched seven innings, hit a home run as well, and the Angels lose seven to four. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it stinks. It's not fair. I mean, the, you know, the, the Angels are aware of the kind of imbalance, mm -hmm. if you will, in terms of payroll and talent. 
Uh, they weren't super deep, so any injuries were going to hurt them, and, and that's what happened. I mean, Mike's only played in 70% of the games this year. Uh, you lose Rendon for the season. That was a huge loss. Huge, Jared yeah, Walsh massive. for most of the second half. Like, that was their, that's their lineup. You know, they've definitely gone through a bunch. Yeah. Uh, talking about the Mets now, since we are a Mets podcast, what yeah. do you think about the, the current team? It's hard not to love them. I mean, look, if you didn't play the Mets on a futures ticket to win the NL or <laughs> win the World Series, you probably missed out on an opportunity. Like, they are beyond complete. And the finishing piece for me was Buck. I mean, it didn't take Buck that long to go back to being manager buck yeah. <laughs> where he's paying attention to every detail where he is completely involved in every phase of what happens from the dugout to the clubhouse to the end of the game he's the best uh and that you know i, I think a lot of high-priced talented payrolls need an adult and he's the perfect adult i can't imagine them hiring anybody else thinking back to the decision to bring him on so i mean you'd be a fool not to like them moving forward and, and I don't even, I can't even tell you with full confidence they're going to win the division. I don't think it matters, right? Yeah. I mean, they're going to get there. We yeah. defer it. It'd you'd, be like nice. the, you'd like that first round bye for yeah. sure. Like, I get that. But uh, I think that either the Mets or the Braves is completely capable of punching the Dodgers in the face and moving on. So uh, last year with the Braves, did you ever in your, all your travels have any interaction with Buck? On a set or yeah. just in passing? Yeah, we've actually called a couple games together. Yeah. Uh, we did a postseason game not too long ago, and he has a way of, uh, you know, getting into that homespun Mississippi State drawl and yep. telling stories, which is great. And he, you know, I think older guys in baseball, and, and Buck probably felt this a little bit, I think there's this silent persecution against them because the, the suggestion is that they're not saber metrics literate mm -hmm. that they don't get the new landscape most of them do and buck especially does he invented some of that stuff as a matter <laughs> of fact so the suggestion that he can't speak analytics and relate to today's ball player is complete hooey uh I i'm a huge fan and I, I it's worth rooting for the mets for for him alone for me yeah no we're we're super excited yeah. i mean we we couldn't have come on on a better year to be working with yeah, the yeah, Mets, yeah. considering everything that's going and on and Degrom's a freak oh yeah my God. right and scherzer coming the, back from the il strikeout day he had against the pirates the other day his number was 12 and a half and he ended up punching out what 13 13, or, yeah. well, 13 in five innings <laughs> yeah five plus yeah. kidding me uh, he's a freak unbelievable yeah <laughs> we've just we've gone through so many people here today and they all talk about how it's just shocking to even watch him pitch to pitch like to you so few pitches and so few parts of the plate and to still see guys walking out of the box being like what did i just see i think even jason delay who's like been a, like a late season player for the pirates probably a third of the fourth string catcher heading into the season he swung and missed the pitch the other day he just like looked and then he turned around and like went to the dugout it's like you can't, you can't yeah. even imagine yeah it's it's i mean he's got a wiffle ball in his hands for five innings <laughs> and hopefully for the mets and their fans it's a wiffle ball in his hands for more like six and a third or seven <laughs> Now, the way that I was first, like, I guess, first found out about you was from playing, you know, video games. I'll be the show ah, and right. all the yeah, baseball yeah. games. Yeah. Do you know, like, about how much people quote you from those games? Like, I, I was in the MLB, the show, I made MLB the show YouTube videos, wow. and, like, the big thing is, like, oh, and he botches it. Like, did you, when you were, like, <laughs> recording those, that's, like, such an iconic sound for MLB the show players. Did you wow. ever expect that, or, like, no. do you even know that that's a big thing? No, no. I don't know that's a big thing. Um, yeah, I did that game for 16 years, yeah. so when I first started doing that game in 2005, wow. it was Scully's last year doing it, and they brought me on as like the third announcer. Was Eric like Chavez on the cover of that Apprentice. one? Apprentice, it may have been Chavez. I think it may, was. May, might have been, I don't remember exactly who, but you never think it's going to turn into that. Like, I'm not a meme-worthy guy in my <laughs> mind, and, and the game was fun to do. Uh, I was told that I'm too old to continue doing it, so it's a wrap after 16 years, but uh. it was fun. The people that put that game together do a really good job, and you know, you don't know when you record a sound that it's going to live forever, and yeah. that it's going to trigger as often as it does, and sometimes it's a mistake. Yeah. So I'll give you one little story. Uh, remember Bobby Kelty, left-handed hitting outfielder? Okay, yeah. Oakland, Boston. Um, there was a line in the game, he had red hair. Yes. So there's a line in the game where I referred to him as the red-headed Bobby Kelty not designed to play every time Bobby <laughs> Kelty has a swing or is, yeah. is put in motion as a defender. But it, there was a glitch in the game. So anytime Bobby Kelty's name came up, it was two and two to the redheaded Bobby Kelty. Oh Here's God. the pitch to the redheaded Bobby <laughs> Kelty, oh right? So God. it was a total glitch, and I felt God. weird about it. 
I remember calling a game. I was working for the Padres at the time, and uh, he was in town with a visiting team, whether it was Oakland or Boston, I forget at that time. And I went up to him and I kind of was like, hey man, I'm Matt, I voiced this game, and I tell him the whole story about the glitch. He looked at me like I had a horn grown out of my head, had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> He's like, yeah, bro, it's great. I got to go hit. <laughs> had no idea. So I was like, okay, well, he's not bothered by it. I shouldn't be. Did you ever play the game at all? Like, I used to play it a lot. Um, after they fired me, I uh, couldn't stand playing the game. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Wouldn't blame you. It, it became yeah, complicated to me to the point where I didn't have the time to dedicate to relearning the game every year. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids are totally into it, and I love that. For me, it was, in fact, the, the last time I played it really seriously w was when it was on the, um, oh man, I can't remember the name of the handheld. PSP. The PSP, right. Yep. I loved it, because I was still working for the Padres, and on the charter, we would turn on the wireless function, I would play against guys on the team That's awesome. who That's really had a cool. PSP. Yeah. And it was pretty cool, like, you know, to beat whoever it was. Trevor Hoffman or cool, <laughs> I mean, like at the game that I voiced. Yeah. I wanted to get one quick question in because I know you're busy today. So obviously we had the COVID season and everything was remote and yeah. now everything's starting to get back to normal. Was there anything that you learned from the COVID season that you feel like you've been able to apply to commentating now? Yeah, that's a good question. There actually was because I felt like I worked a little bit harder during the COVID season, to be mm -hmm. honest. You didn't have, you couldn't take things for granted. So if I wanted to ask a question to somebody, instead of just thinking, oh, I'll see him at the ballpark, you'd have to make an effort to reach out to that person. Whether it was a hitting coach or a pitching coach or whomever, I actually created some new relationships because I had to be a little bit more proactive. And mm. I, I guess it brought like the reporter aspect in my job out, which I had previously kind of disregarded mm. because I don't consider myself a reporter per se. Yeah. But you had to go there and I learned a little bit during that. Have there been any additional hurdles since you guys now have access again to building relationships with players, maybe falling off of players, like any kind of, that muscle go away in the, uh, in the year lost? No, not really. I think it, I've changed a little bit in that because of protocols and because we, the dirty, filthy, unwashed media, <laughs> are still supposed to wear masks in the clubhouse around most teams, I just don't go in there anymore. Yeah. yeah. And really, they don't want us in there anyway. And it's okay because we can do our jobs just by getting access to guys when they come out on the field. Yeah. And I feel like that should be protocol. I feel like that should be their space. I know that other reporters are gonna look at me like I'm an idiot and I get it, uh, you're doing your job. But I personally feel like the clubhouse should be a sanctuary for players only. We should have access to them in other spots. I kind of agree with that. I, yeah. I like that. I think that's a good take. And I think that's a perfect way for us to end it. We know you're busy today. Thank you so All much good. for taking this time and doing the episode. Okay. And uh, perfect. Matt Faskersion, thank you guys. <laughs> Get up, get, get up, get up.